I'm Jamie Craggs, I'm the Aquarium Curator here at the Hornman Museum and Gardens and so I oversee the living collection within the museum and I head up Project Coral which is looking at uh, spawning corals in aquarium environments. Project Coral started uh, in 2012 and it started with a really simple question, could we get broadcast corals to spawn in a very planned and predictable way in, a, in an aquarium ex situ environment? And if we can do that, taking that a step further, can we then start manipulating the time of year at which corals can spawn, but do it in a very planned and predictable way so that we can uh, develop a whole research program around that. It's really been uh, five years of work to create a platform of this spawning, uh, which then is enabling lots of other research um, to occur. Trying to stimulate broadcast spawning has always been a bit of the holy grail of um, the research community, but also uh, you know, the hobby community. Um, there have been spawning events in public aquariums and people's home aquaria, but they've always been unplanned, unpredictable events, often catching the onlooker by surprise. And with that, you can't then do any work with the gametes. Um, so fundamentally, what we're trying to do is make it predictable so that we know when the coral is going to spawn, uh, we can collect the eggs and sperm, and then do in vitro fertilization and, and lots of research can then take place once we've cracked that. We replicate uh, geographical environments. Um, so we source the corals from specific locations where we know what the pattern of spawning is in the wild. Um, and that's really important because it gives you a pinpoint moment in time when you know they're gonna spawn in the wild. We can then source data sets from that location, program microprocessors uh, back here um, in the museum and replicate all of the conditions that, that um, are required to stimulate that spawning activity. There's, um, I mean, there's been a huge body of work since the, the early 80s, um, a lot focusing on the Great Barrier Reef and then um, other areas in the world. We now know lots of areas synchronously spawn um, and the theory is, is that there's um, a number of environmental cues that work in a progressively finer scale right up to the moment of spawning. So there's still some debate about whether temperature or something called solar irradiation um, is the thing that's initially queuing them up to spawn, uh, telling the coral which month to go. And then the interplay between the photo period and the lunar cycle is the, 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 they're the, the parameters that sync the coral into the exact night, but also in some cases the exact minutes of each year which to go. So we have been working with Acropros, um, the reason behind that is they're uh, branching, so we can break branches off and look at the gamete development. It takes between three and five months for the eggs to develop. Um, we've so far spawned 18 species of acroprids. Um, we will be looking at diversifying that over, over the coming years and looking at different genera um, of corals as well. Now. So they, they spawn once a year in the wild. Uh, what we have seen with some of our corals is that we can get two spawnings a year out of the same coral. Um, there's still so much we don't know about this yet. How far can we push it? Obviously we can't um, rush that egg development any quicker um, because it may have adverse effects in terms of the quality of the egg. Um, so there's certainly limitations about how far we can take that. Um, a lot of what we're looking at doing is not forcing the same coral to spawn, um, but we uh, move the environmental conditions in each of the systems. So we move uh, the spawning um, for the colonies in each system. The last five years has uh, is been about creating this platform so we know how to stimulate them to spawn. There are big questions about uh, restoration, whether we can restore damage reefs, and many researchers are looking at sexual reproduction as a mechanism of reducing the material uh, to reseed the reef. The challenge we have at the moment is upscaling the effort. So these restoration practices can happen over relatively small scales, but they're not happening over Ge uh, geographically meaningful um, scales. So by increasing the number of spawns you have access to um, a year, you can hopefully get to those answers quicker about whether it is feasible to upscale restoration. So not pushing the same colony to spawn, but if you fragment a colony, you could split that over multiple tanks and then stagger the spawning, which gives you more, um, more sort of bites um, at, at, at um, you know, the cherry root. Um, some of the limitations, because they only spawn over one or two nights a year, 
is things can go wrong. You know, you can lose an entire year's worth of research if a storm comes by and you, you can't get your corals out before the spawn, or equipment failures, all of these are common um, issues. And so if we can bring that ex situ, so we're not relying on collecting uh, eggs and sperm in the wild, uh, one, it gives us a lot more control, but then if we break that uh, natural cycle and get multiple spawnings, it accelerates the speed at which knowledge can be gained. We're looking at um, how we can support predominantly restoration um, on a number of fronts, both applied um, uh, research angles, so how can we uh, improve this upscaling through using some of our husbandry knowledge. One aspect we're looking at is co-culturing, so not just focusing on the corals, but also breeding uh, beneficial herbivorous species, so we can increase the number of corals we produce. But then we can also start looking at um, uh, uh, reproduction at a fundamental level. One of the great access that we have here is we're replicating two different geographical environments. So we spawn both Australian species as well as Singapore species, and we can uh, move uh, those spawns that they coincide. And this has opened up a huge opportunity to look at hybridization from two very different um, types of environments and hopefully give us some insight about um, how resilience is inherited at a fundamental level, a genomics, proteomics and metabolomic level.